Hey, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us again here at Hosanna Lutheran Church in Little Palms Preschool. As we gather again as the body of Christ, as the people, as the family of God, to lift our prayers and our praise and our thanksgiving to Him, to hear His Word proclaimed and to rejoice in the fellowship that we know. We thank you for those who are joining us via this online option, and uh, we also look forward to seeing folks here in person as well. If you are considering coming to join us in person, I want you to know that in July we will be offering two worship services. One will be at 9 o'clock, a traditional style worship service at 9 o'clock, followed by the praise service with the band at 10.30 in the morning. So 9 o'clock and 10.30 will be the in-person worship times through the month of July. When we get to August, we're going to go back to our regular worship times at 8 and 10.30 and offer at least one adult Bible study in between. But for now, uh, if you plan to come and join us in person, plan on 9 o'clock and 10.30 through the month of July. Otherwise, this online option is still going to be available to you. We're going to make this a permanent part of the uh, Hosanna worship life. So you can join us uh, if you're at home or if you're traveling someplace and would like to join us as well. Uh, just check us out through our website or through Facebook or through the YouTube channel as well. So to begin with this day, I want to ask you if you would, let's call upon the name of the Lord together. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, and we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for you, and for his sake, he forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's lift our voices together in a song of praise for him.
I've got a few scripture readings I want to share with you this morning. I'm going to share the epistle reading first, and then the Old Testament and the gospel reading, and you'll see how the two of them actually are linked together. They go hand in hand. One is the prophecy and the other uh, the fulfillment. But uh, to begin with, I want to share this reading with you from 1 Peter chapter 3. This is a moment when Peter had been already speaking about how there are some people who frankly are just hostile toward, uh, toward God and toward his people, and, and he was wanting to emphasize the need for our confidence in our faith, a confidence in God, understanding him, knowing who he is, understanding what our faith is, so that we can have confidence also in ourselves and who it is that God makes us to be. We, we need confidence in God and confidence in ourselves and our relationship together because God calls us to witness to even those people who are hostile toward us because of our faith in Jesus. So listen to what Peter says here in 1 Peter chapter 3. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He has put to death in the body, he was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit through whom He also went and preached to the spirits in prison who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now I want to share this Old Testament reading with you. It's from Isaiah chapter 35. It's the whole chapter. It's only 10 verses long. But Isaiah chapter 35, he speaks about, uh, he's speaking to people who at that moment were still in exile, but he is promising them a time when they will be returned, not only when they will be returned in the uh, near future in their own lives, but when God would bring about the, the recreation, when God's kingdom itself would come, wherever God's kingdom is found, there comes health and wholeness and life itself is restored. And so he's going to paint this picture of the restoration of life and the coming of the kingdom of heaven. And if you were with us last week, you might remember the message that Jesus sent the disciples out with was to simply go out and proclaim the kingdom of heaven has come near. Well, wherever the kingdom of heaven has come, health and wholeness and life itself is restored. And so Isaiah gives us the promise of that restoration You'll hear in the gospel how Jesus brings the fulfillment of that restoration. Isaiah paints this picture of the coming of the kingdom of heaven like this. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon, They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Lebanon, Carmel, and Sharon, by the way. Uh, Lebanon is known for its great mighty uh, trees, and it was a symbol of strength. Carmel overlooks the Jezreel Valley and the the fields, the fertile, the breadbasket of Israel. It's a symbol of life. And the plain of Sharon, which is in front of the Mediterranean Sea, is known for the beauty of its roses, the rose of Sharon. So strength, life, and beauty. That's the glory of Lebanon and Carmel and Sharon. And they will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. 
Strengthen the feeble hands. Steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear, for your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs. In the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. And a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk in that way. The unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor will any ferocious beast be found there, but only the redeemed will walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord will return. They will enter Zion with singing, everlasting joy will crown their heads, gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. And This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, with that picture of restoration in mind, I want to turn to the gospel reading that greets us today. It's the gospel according to St. Matthew, the 11th chapter, first 15 verses, 1 through 15. This is a moment when John the Baptist has carried out his ministry, and by now he has been imprisoned in a dungeon by Herod because John the Baptist called him on some of the sins of his life. Herod didn't like that, so he has him imprisoned. And John knows that things have gone really bad for him at this point. He knows that uh, nobody comes out of Herod's dungeon alive. He knows it's going to be his death. Things are not happening quite the way John had ex expected them to. And so his confidence has been shaken. And he wants to know if he's actually dying for the right one. And so he sends his disciples to seek out confirmation from Jesus. Listen closely to the question that they come and the way in which Jesus answers this question for them, for John, and for all of us as well. After Jesus had finished, finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John, who was in prison, heard what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor." Blessed is the one who does not fall away on account of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful men lay hold of it. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. Whoever has ears, let them hear. And this is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let's lift our voices again in a song of praise for him. Oh, I heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I heard a tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and they tell me that. 
that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. And I Folks, let's pray a moment. Gracious Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Lord, bless the words and the message and make them yours. Let your spirit speak and do not let me be the stumbling block between you and your people. And we pray this, Lord, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen indeed. So <clears throat> I want to start by asking you a uh, question I'd like you to really contemplate for a moment. And the question is this, um, how confident do you feel? I mean, what's your, what's your confidence level like right about now? I mean, just kind of imagine for a moment, do a quick personal kind of silent, honest inventory. What's your confidence level like right now? Now, anybody who's around Hosanna very much, my family, our staff, my friends, people who kind of just walk in the door during the week, everybody knows that I kind of hit people up with a sermon survey question every week because I have a tendency to sort of think out loud as I process scripture readings and how am I going to communicate this? What is it the, that I really want to get across to people? And so the sermon survey question this week has been this. What's your confidence level like? How confident do you feel? Now, if you are like all of the people that I've surveyed this week, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, it depends. Confidence in what? You see, there are some things maybe you feel a great sort of sense of confidence in, and other things, 
probably not so much confidence after all. So I want you to think about the concept of confidence. In fact, uh, let's kind of think about the English language for a moment. Imagine if you had to learn the English language totally from scratch. Even that phrase right there would be kind of confusing to you. From scratch, you're going to learn language from scratch. Isn't a scratch a thing? Or you could bake something from scratch. That's how confusing the English language is. Well, there's a lot of related words and concepts throughout the English language. So one of them happens to deal with confidence. So I want you to think about some of these words. There is confident, confidential, confide, confidant, uh, confidence, and confirmation. Let me give you some of the dictionary uh, definitions for a moment. Confident. To be confident means uh, trustful assurance full of conviction. Confidence is a trustful assurance full of conviction. Confidential means secret information, and to confide in somebody means you're going to convey, convey to them some secretive information. It's sensitive information. So you confide confidential information to a confidant. That would be one to whom you feel that you can confide confidential information. And you have confidence in that person. Confidence, here's the definition of confidence, faith or belief that one will act in a right, proper, or effective way according to certain expectations. Listen to that again for just a moment. Confidence is a faith or belief that somebody will act in a right, proper, or effective way according to certain expectations. And then confirmation is recognizing evidence that supports the truth of a belief. Recognizing evidence that supports the truth of a belief. That's confirmation. So sometimes you need confirmation that you can be confident, that you can have confidence in a confidant. Did you follow all of that? Uh, you're doing probably better than I am if you really did follow all of that. But, but with all of that in mind, I want you to think about confidence for a moment. Faith or belief that somebody will act in a right, proper, or effective way according to certain expectations. So how's your confidence level? How confident are you right now in our political structure, in the people who currently hold office, in the list of candidates running for office? How much confidence do you have in our political system in America to take care of you and solve the problems of America? You feeling pretty confident? <laughs> you might be uh, in a pretty small group on that one. How much confidence do you have in mainstream media right now? Are they really speaking the truth? Do they really just want to convey facts and information and, and have your best interest in mind? Are you confident in the media right now? How much confidence do you have in your financial position, your financial situation right now? Are you, are you pretty confident you're financially sound? Let's say we close the economy for three more months, and then how confident do you think you're going to feel in your retirement plan and in your job security and all of that kind of stuff? Pretty confident? Uh, how much confidence do you have in yourself? Are you confident in yourself? I've been asking people that. That's a lot tougher question to sort of contemplate for a moment. And if you're, if you're like nearly everybody that I've asked this survey question to throughout this week, then you might want to respond like this. Most of the people said, well, I'm pretty confident in some areas of my life and not very confident in other areas of my life. Maybe you're thinking to yourself, I'm, I'm pretty confident in my ability to do my job. I'm really good at doing my job. <sighs> not so good at marriage or family. Or maybe you're thinking, I'm really good at raising my kids and nurturing and pouring into them, but the career path might be a little shaky. I'm really confident in my own physical strength and, and, and health and well-being, you know, until I, until I go out there into the public where everybody keeps telling me that every surface I touch is somehow going to be the death sentence. I'm confident in some areas and not in others. I'm very confident in, in, in my ability to utilize my skills and talents and all of that, but not so confident in selecting, you know, the relationships or friendships. I kind of find myself stumbling into poisoned relationships. You know, whatever it might be in your own life, people find themselves very confident in certain areas and very 
inconfident, unconfident in other areas. And I, I want you to think about this. What might undermine your confidence? What is it that really tears away at your confidence, shakes you in your confidence? I kind of find it, it, it tends to be three key things, and those are uh, uh, failures, betrayals, and the unexpected. What really shakes your confidence in, in the people around you, the relationships that you might have, it's your spouse, your family, your circle of friends, coworkers, whatever it might be, your relationship with the people around you. What can shake your confidence in those relationships and the trust that you have? Maybe it's failures. Could be failures on their part. Betrayals. When someone betrays you, it's like a punch to the gut. I mean, it's just, it shakes you in your confidence. What about the unexpected. Sometimes people act in ways that we didn't think that they would, that we didn't think that they should or don't wish they would. Failures and betrayals and the unexpected can shake our relationships with the people around us. And sometimes we lose confidence. But what about in ourselves? Do you have confidence in yourself? And like people said, well, I'm confident in some areas, not so much in others. What shakes your confidence in yourself? Is it second guessing? Is it some sort of a voice that tries to speak to you in the darkness of the night and it wants to continue to remind you? What does it want to remind you of? It wants to remind you of failures and betrayals. The unexpected. Now, it reminds you of your own failures. You remember that time when you said something that came out so foolish and you hurt somebody's heart? You, you remember that time when you couldn't find the right words to comfort someone in need? You remember when you acted in such a way, you did such a thing, and you learn to regret and you replay these things, and pretty soon your own history begins to haunt you in the middle of the night, and this voice keeps trying to whisper into your ear about your failures or the betrayals. Maybe a betrayal you have brought against another or what someone has brought against you. Or the unexpected. How about that voice lately saying, I don't, I don't know why the world is going the way that it's going. I don't know why uh, this pandemic continues to flourish and grow. I don't know why the economy is in such a, a train wreck when just a few short months ago we seem to be rolling with just steam power ahead. I don't know why the, uh, the political world that we are watching is just coming apart at the seams and it seems to be nothing but extremes and buffoons. I don't know why the media acts like it does. Everybody seems to want to hate everybody else, and people are feeling so much heat and hatred and persecution no matter who you are. It's failures and betrayals and the unexpected, and it undermines our, our confidence in our relationship with those around us. Sometimes we just put up barriers, sometimes maybe even rightly so, to protect ourselves from future heartache and grief. Sometimes it's just isolation, and sometimes we lose confidence even in ourselves, and we lose sight of who it is that God has made us to be. How about your confidence in God? How's your confidence level there? Now, I think we all usually want to say, absolutely, 100%, I'm totally confident in who God is and my relationship with Him. Sometimes maybe that's true. But I'll tell you what, there are times when we kind of question and we wonder, why is God doing the things that He's doing or not doing the things that we think He should be doing or not doing what we wish he would be doing. Why isn't God taking direction from me? Sometimes I just, in frustration and heartache and grief or whatever it might be, I, I want to cry out to God from a sense of pain. I want to shake my fist at God and say, this isn't right. Sometimes I just want to question God and say, why, why would a worldwide pandemic be allowed to just run amok? Why an economy in the tank? Why is there so much heartache and grief and hatred and turmoil? Why are the races so racial? divided among us. Why can't we all just look at one another as the children of God together? Why? Because we all have this sinful nature within us and the world around us is a sin-filled, fallen, broken place and sometimes we cry out to God and we say, why is it this way, Lord? We want to question Him. I'm keenly confident until the doctor says it's cancer. I'm keenly confident 
until the employer says, we're not going to make it, and you need to go file for unemployment. I'm keenly confident in my own skills and abilities with the people around me until that voice starts to speak in my own mind again, or I remember the, the failures and the betrayals and the unexpected. And sometimes I turn that anger, frustration, disappointment, heartache, grief, whatever you want to call it, I turn it back toward God. And I say, why God? Is everything the way it is? I like to think, and we all like to think, that we are keenly confident in God, but sometimes we find ourselves standing in a dungeon alongside John the Baptist. There was John the Baptist, Matthew chapter 11. This is John the Baptist. I want you to imagine yourself in that cold, dark, damp, dreary dungeon and thinking to yourself, why are we here, Lord? Why are we in this place? Why are we in this kind of heartache? Why are we in this kind of fear and turmoil and sorrow and grief? Why aren't things working out the way we think they should? That was certainly on the heart of John the Baptist. This is John the Baptist. This is a guy who had spoken in unbelievable confidence. He was the one who actually leaped for joy in his mother's womb when the Messiah had only come near. This was the one who had come as the forerunner to the Christ, and he spoke in unbelievable confidence as the voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God, repent and turn your hearts to the Lord again. That's what he said. The kingdom of heaven has come near. This was the guy who chastised the, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Who told you brood of vipers to repent and turn away from the coming wrath? He was a man who spoke in incredible confidence. And in fact, John the Baptist was the guy who actually bridged the gap between the Old Testament, all of the prophets and the promises of this coming Messiah, this servant who would sacrifice himself and, and redeem and restore us to God's own family, he bridged the gap from the promises made to the promises fulfilled. John was the one who finally got to point straight at Jesus, and he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is him. He has come. John spoke in incredible confidence. And then some time wore on. And Jesus began to preach and teach and to go about his mission. But it wasn't what John would, had expected. John was anticipating that judgment day would come and, and eternity would begin and the Savior was here. But he didn't know that Jesus had come at that time not for judgment day, but for salvation day. And the life of the church was about to dawn in a whole new sort of way. And so here was John shaken in his confidence, and he needed confirmation for his confidence to be restored. And so John sent some of his followers to go to Jesus, and, and they asked him the same question that maybe we want to ask him sometimes. Are you the one? They came to him, you see, and, uh, with a message from John, and they said, are you the one who was to come, or should we be watching for someone else? Are you the one? You see, John, was, he knew that this was going to end in his death in this dungeon, and he wanted to know if he was dying for the right one. And you and I, we often want to know, are we living for the right one? Jesus, are you the one? Are you really who you claim to be? And he could have chastised John for having a weakness in faith, but he didn't. He understood that these fragile, mortal hearts and souls of ours, they get shaken in their shoes. They, we, our confidence is undermined sometimes. And maybe it's failure, but that's on our part. Maybe it's betrayal, that's still on our part. Or maybe it's the unexpected God doesn't always act in the ways that we think he should or wish he would, and there was Jesus. He wanted to give confirmation to John, and so what did he do? He turned to the disciples that had come, and he said, go and tell John what you hear and see. 
Go tell him the blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Go and tell John that all the things Isaiah promised, I'm doing here and now. Look at the evidence and receive that as confirmation. Your faith is rightly placed. and The kingdom of heaven has come. And wherever Jesus is, there is health and healing and wholeness and new life being born. In fact, Jesus goes on and gives us this great blessing and promise. He says, blessed is the one who does not fall away on account of me. I want to unpack that one for just a moment. Maybe if you translate it or explain it a little more deeply, blessed is the one who does not fall away on account of me. Blessed is the one who holds on in faith. Blessed is the one who clings to the promises of God. Blessed is the one who will never fall away even if his confidence gets shaken. Blessed is the one who will never fall away because I've got a hold of you, Jesus says. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. I am with you always to the very end of the age, no matter what storm comes, no matter what sort of uh, failures or betrayals or the unexpected you might experience, no matter what, Jesus says, I've got a hold of you. Blessed is the one who will not fall away on account of me, because of me, because I've come for you. Jesus went on from there to fulfill all of his mission and ministry. He had come so that we might know forgiveness, renewal, new life today, and eternal life to come in his heavenly home. And those things would require the fullness of the promises of the Old Testament prophecies, prophets to be fulfilled, to be made real. They had promised a heaven-sent Savior, a suffering servant, and by his wounds we would be healed, and he would see the light of life and be satisfied, and Jesus fulfilled it all. He lived it out so that we might know that we can trust in him. He marched on from chapter 11 all the way through the rest of Matthew's gospel. He made his way into villages and families and lives that were such Broken train wrecks, wherever they were, they each dealt with heartache and grief and sorrow and sickness and death. And he brought wholeness and health and new life. And he invited people to continue to follow him. And we follow him all the way into the city of Jerusalem and into that moment when he gives himself in sacrifice for your sins and mine, when he dies upon the cross and atones for us all, we follow him still while he's sealed up in a grave, and on the third day he rose up victorious, even over death, and he gives to us freely the gift of forgiveness and new life here in time the promise of eternity to come. In my Father's house, there are many rooms, and I'm going to go prepare a place for you. I'll come back and receive you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. He carried it all out, and he inspired the writers to record the message, the entire record for us, so that we might have confidence in him. In fact, he inspired the writers of Scripture to to describe him as the rock of our salvation. And believe me, you can have rock solid confidence in Christ. Have confidence in yourself and who it is that he has made you to be. You have been redeemed and restored to God's own family. You are a child of God. Have confidence in speaking the truth in love to all those who would ask you the reason for the hope that you have. Have confidence in sharing his love, mercy, and grace. Have confidence in following in the footsteps of Jesus. Have confidence in him. Today and always, in Jesus' holy name, amen. And may the peace of God which surpasses all of our understanding keep our hearts and minds in the one true faith in Christ Jesus our Lord until that day when he receives us home. Amen.
Amen, indeed. Let's lift our voices in a song of praise for him again. Let's pray. We pray for all the people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. In the prayers of the church today especially, we lift up uh, our own preschool, Little Palms Preschool, as our enrollments are underway, and we ask God to bring us uh, more and more families so that we might have every opportunity to share Christ with them. We also lift up the Hurraway family. Alex Hurraway, as many of the Hosanna family knows, uh, was called to his eternal rest this past week. His Memorial service was here at Hosanna on Friday, and so we ask God to bring comfort to those who are hurting, to those who are shaken in their confidence because of the unexpected that has come. We ask God to bring the peace that is beyond all understanding. Let's pray. 
Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you have blessed us with this day with the gift of life. We thank you, Lord, for the breath of life you place within us and the gift of new life you have poured out upon us through Christ our Savior. By his death and resurrection from the grave, you have redeemed and restored us to your family. You call us to live this new life by faith. You give us the promise of eternal life to come, and you gather us together. In person and even by way of these electronic means, you gather us together as one, as the body of Christ, and you invite us to call upon you and ask, O Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O gracious God, Lord of the church, be at work in and through your uh, people here at Hosanna, we pray, and in all your congregations all over the world. Lord, bless us that we might know the power of your Spirit leading us and enlightening us and giving us your wisdom and guidance. Lord, uh, utilize your word as that lamp unto our feet, the light unto our path. Bless us, Lord, in the uh, opportunities of outreach and mission that you place before us. Give us eyes that are open to those opportunities so that we might courageously seize hold of them and share the good news. Be prepared to give an answer to everyone who has the reason for the hope that we have. Today, especially, Lord, we pray uh, for Little Palms Preschool, and we ask you to continue to draw families in now that we know that the school year is going to get underway in August. We ask you, Lord, to draw those families in, reassure them that we will love their children even as they do. Uh, draw them in and give us every opportunity, Lord, to share the good news of Jesus with those children and with their families and uh, their siblings, their friends. Bless us, Lord, as we might uh, bring them in and impart wisdom and knowledge in the academic structure and also that we might share the good news of Christ our Savior with them. Let those efforts be fruitful for your name's sake. O Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, there are many among us who are suffering from illness or injury or brokenness in the body in so many ways. And we pray, Lord, be with those whom we each name in our own families or lives right now, whom we know to be suffering. Provide for them, Lord, the medical teams and resources and all they need to bring healing, to bring strength and recovery. For those who are suffering from ailment, uh, help them, Lord, to know your presence. And for those who keep vigil with them, lead them, Lord, to fix their eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, Lord of life, you measure out the number of our days, and sometimes we wonder why that number might not be longer than it is. We, all, we don't know, Lord, but we entrust ourselves always to your mercy, your grace, and to your eternal loving care. And we ask you, Lord, to be with the friends and the family of Alex, whom you have called to his eternal rest. Bless them with a kind of peace that surpasses all understanding. Remind them, Lord that no one is ever beyond your reach or your want, your love and your grace. Alex trusted in you for all of his life, Lord. We entrust him to your eternal care. Comfort those who mourn his passing. Lead them to find strength and love in one another and to, and to focus their eyes on the promise of Christ and the blessed day of reunion that you hold in store. Keep us steadfast in the faith throughout these earthly journeys until that day when we too are gathered there on that beautiful shore. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh Lord, we, we entrust all these things to your loving mercy and grace through Christ our Savior, who made us your own and who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. I thank you all for joining us this day and and before we go, I want to end our service like we always do here at Hosanna with a reminder of just who we really are so you can have confidence in yourself. We always say, go in God's peace, for we are his children. 
Amen. Let's lift our voices one more time in a song of praise for Him. Amen. Running for your heart, I'm running for.